Good day. My name is Aubrey Pedersen, and I will be facilitating this training session for you today. My background is that of a trauma counsellor. I've been a trauma counsellor for about the past 30 years, and during that time, I have specialised in crime-related trauma. A lot of the work that I do is dealing with victims of gender-based violence and abuse. Now, the perpetrators of this crime are generally male. Even though it could be female, I find the work I do, by far the majority of the perpetrators are male and the victims are female. So during this session, I very often will be referring to the perpetrator as he or him. Please understand it's because that's what I work with all the time. So what are we going to do during this session? It's going to be about 30 minutes long. I'm going to be giving you a few different modules and we're going to basically be focusing on verbal, emotional, and mental abuse. We are not going to move on to the physical abuse for this particular session. In other words, how to fight back if you have to. But we're going to look at relationships and the difficulties and very often the subtle abuse that takes place. When I work with groups of women, very often they say to me, how do I even know if I'm in an abusive relationship? What does that look like? Because sometimes it, it just doesn't feel right. So we're going to be looking today at what abuse is all about. And, and you will realize that quite often it's incredibly subtle. And quite often it starts very subtle. And then it gradually increases, increases and gets worse and worse. And before you know it, you go, how did I even get here? So I want to, to take you through a process of identifying what abuse is all about. And then we'll chat briefly about what you could do to try get out of the situation. And is it possible to fix it? I hope you're going to find a lot of uh, benefit from from the few modules that we're going to go through. Um, and please always remember, and I will reiterate this again, that there is help available and you need to ask for it. Welcome back. And in this module, we're going to look at abuse within relationships. And, you know, when you, you meet someone and you fall in love, you both are very excited, you've got possibly butterflies in your stomach, and you look forward to this relationship and, and what it's going to bring to, to both of you. And you're in love, and you have fun, and you can't wait to see each other on a daily basis. But then sometimes things start going wrong. It just doesn't feel right anymore. It just doesn't feel the same anymore. And it's because very often one of the partners starts withholding love. Now, I've very often asked this question. Is withholding love abusive? I very much believe it is. And it's also where many relationships that end up being severely abusive, this is very often where they start just withholding love. Sometimes this is very subtle and you, you almost don't even notice it and you go, something just doesn't feel right. So when I have a look at withholding love, I have seen that there are about six different types of withholding love. And so I want to look at these different categories. And so to start off with, the first one I want to look at is what I call hurtful words. Um, I'm going to be referring here very often to him as the abuser, but please understand it could be her who is the abuser. Um, it's just that I mostly deal with women who are abused by the man, and this is why for this particular segment, we can, I'm going to just refer to the abuser as him. So this is where very often he would say things like, you are so stupid, or you are fat or no one would want you. Now, very often he'd do this in a very joking way. And he'll go, or he'd say something and you'd get upset and he'll go, oh man, you know, I'm just joking with you. 
But the problem is when it gets said over and over and over, it starts hurting. And you very often start saying, well, is there truth behind what he is saying? Things like you are useless. You're a bad mother. These things hurt. You're weak. I feel sorry for you. Those are just some examples of what I call hurtful words. Let's have a look at the next category. And that is what I call too busy. So yeah, you find he doesn't give you attention. And it's really because he's just too busy. Doesn't take time to hear you. So he doesn't make time to, to find out how your day went. Or if he said, how was your day? He's been too busy to even listen to you because he's busy with something else. You know, sit down and say, tell me about your day. Doesn't take you on dates. Too busy to spend quality time. So he doesn't say, listen, I'm going to take Saturday. I'm just going to take, put everything aside, take the time out just to spend with you. What would you like to do? Spends time with friends, though, and has time for personal interests, his hobbies, and that, that kind of thing. And you're the one who has to run after him. And those are examples of what I call too busy. Right, the next category is no spoils. So, yeah, he never buys a special present. Now, I'm not saying like a car or something, just something small, but something that's special and that will be special to you, where you know that he's put a lot of thought into it. No little surprises, like saying, guess what? I bought stuff because we're going on a picnic. No thoughtful little gifts. So it might be your, your birthday and he buys you a box of chocolates, flowers or whatever. But he, he didn't put a lot of thought into it. Never takes you to special places, theater, or things that you enjoy. Don't go on thoughtful outings. And doesn't go out of his way to make you feel special. And this is what I call no spoils. Right. The next one is no help. And yeah, he doesn't help with household chores. And it's because he says, no, that's not my job. Who said that household chores is not his job? Just because he works hard all day? We all work hard. Sometimes we need to share in working in the house as well. And even if you and him have got an agreement that you will do the housework, what stops him from when you're tired saying, ah, let me help you. Doesn't go to the shop for you. So you might be hectically busy and you go, oh, I've still got to get to the shop. And he's watching TV instead of just saying, hey, give me the list. I'll go get it for you. Never says, how can I help? Especially when you're stressed, tired, that's a good time for him to say, hey, you guys sit down. Let me do what you're doing. Doesn't keep you company. And what I mean by this is you might be preparing supper and he's sitting and watching TV. Why not get up and come keep you company in the kitchen? Maybe get involved in the food. Won't go out of his way to assist you with a problem. It's your problem sorted out. Right, then the next one is withholding affection. This is probably one of the worst because in a loving relationship, affection is one of the most important things. You want to know that you are loved and affection, being affectionate is the one way that you show each other that you love each other. So it doesn't gently touch you run his fingers up your arm, maybe while you're watching TV, or when he passes you in the passage, just gently touch you. Doesn't just cuddle you for no reason. Doesn't hold your hand. Maybe when you're having 
you go out for dinner, hold your hand and look into your eyes, looks deeply into your eyes and says, you are so beautiful. Doesn't express his love for you. And yeah, little, sending you little WhatsApp messages. You are my everything. I can't wait to see you. Life would be boring and horrible without you. That kind of thing. Doesn't tell you how beautiful you are. And this should happen on a daily basis. Right, and then the final category, and, and this is probably the, the worst part of withholding love. And this is what I call deceit. This is where he lies to you. And then when you find out um, what he's lying about, he will deny it. Does things behind your back. Keeps household information from you. So, you know, he says, I, we don't have money for this. But meanwhile, you know that he must have a lot of money because where does he, what does he do with it all? Meets up with other women without your knowledge. Cheats on you. And has affairs. Deceit is such a horrible thing. Right, and, and these are what I call withholding love. And I, without a doubt, believe that that is abusive. In this next module, we're going to have a look at the different types of abusers. Not all abusers are the same, obviously. And very often I find that many of them have got some kind of psychological disorder. If you go and do some research, you'll hear about some of these disorders. Very often we find narcissistic behavior. Uh, it's very common in abuse. Uh, or sometimes they have antisocial behavior. He could be a sociopath or he might have borderline dis personality disorder. I find, however, the majority of them, maybe not the majority, but very often and very common at this point in time, is what we call a misogynist. So often when I go through the kind of character the person has who is abusing my client, and I ask her, tell me a bit about him, so quickly I go, mm another misogynist. So if we have a look at a misogynist, if we were to look at the, um, the dictionary translation, the translation is a woman hater. The, the other translation is extreme prejudice against women. I actually prefer the second definition and, and really because woman hater kind of gives you the impression that he goes around doing nasty things to women. However, it's really not that he, he in fact appears the opposite he's very charming loving very often and that's what you see from the outside so i would say extreme prejudice against women is maybe a better term for a misogynist do we get a female um, form of misogynist yes absolutely we do um, and we call her a misandrist and basically, the definition is the same. Misandrist is a man-hater or extreme prejudice against men. So I want to look at the characteristics of the misogynist. So often, when I'm in a lecture room and I'm explaining what a misogynist is, I have women who go, oh my goodness, I know one. Or even worse, I'm living with one. So let's have a look. Now, what you find is he generally will zero in on one woman. He isn't um, abusive to, to all the women that he knows. He selects one and he starts taking control of her life. Initially, you won't notice it because he's flirtatious, he's exciting, he's a lot of fun, he's charismatic, and he spoils you rotten. And... What you don't notice, however, is that he makes all the decisions. So he'll never say, what do you want to do? He always, and it'll sound as if he's spoiling you. So he'll say, for instance, on Friday night, I'm taking you to movies. Or on Saturday, we're going here, and then we're going there. 
but he doesn't allow you to make decisions. And that starts influencing more and more of your life as well, because he starts telling you what you should do, what you shouldn't do. Um, he starts telling you how you should dress. And maybe when you're going out, he will say to you, I don't like that, go change. And he also then starts telling you who you can see and who you can't. And very often you now start seeing less and less of your friends, in particular men. He won't be very happy if you're speaking to other men. He begins to reveal like a Jekyll and a Hyde personality. You know, like one moment he is wonderful, loving, kind. Next moment he will say such horrible things to you, break you down, insult you. And almost immediately, he'll apologize and again be loving and kind. He starts breaking you down. And this is his real object, objective. He wants to make you totally insecure. And he does this by telling you things, telling you how useless you are and worthless you are, and that there'll be no one will ever want to be with you. And you actually start buying into this and you start believing him. And that's what breaks you down and makes you totally insecure because if you're insecure, you won't leave him because you can't, you don't believe you can do it on your own. He knows exactly what to say to make you feel good as well. So he, because he knows you so well, he knows your weaknesses and then he will pry on that and he'll say things to you that make you feel good, make you feel wonderful. Because what he wants to do is he wants to almost become like a drug. He feels good and the good sometimes you might believe outweighs the bad. He becomes like a drug, you can't cope without him. And he becomes very possessive. It's, it doesn't just happen immediately, it starts very gently. And this builds and builds and builds and builds. And this is the common traits of the misogynist. What we're gonna look at now is in an abusive relationship, there are definitely different stages that the relationship goes through. And in fact, we have noticed there are three different levels of abuse. And this is what we're going to now look at. What we're now going to look at is what we call the cycle of abuse. Yeah, we have established that there are three different stages. And the first stage being the honeymoon stage. Yeah, you find the perpetrator has displayed for the first time some form of abusive behavior. It could be verbal, it could be emotional, or even at times physical. He apologizes for what happened. He's very remorseful. He promises it won't happen again. Sometimes he cries. He threatens suicide. He tries to justify his behavior. He blames drugs or alcohol, or sometimes stress, promises to get help, and he wants to be intimate. The victim at this time, she's understanding. She forgives him. If she left, she returns. She's relieved. She's hopeful. And she sets up counseling. The abuse at this point is verbal, mental, and emotional. And at times could be physical. I have found that if they do at this stage go for counseling, they could save the relationship. However, if they don't, it will escalate to the second stage. 
The second stage is referred to as tension building. Yeah, we find lots of aggression. He shouts, very often yelling, withholds affection. He puts you down. He threatens you and threatens to harm family members. He's oversensitive. Isolates you. So he doesn't allow you to see your friends and even family members. He's got crazy behavior. One minute he's fantastic, the next he's a horror. Makes accusations of unfaithfulness engages you to argue, damages your property. The victim at this time, she's compliant. She is scared, attempts to calm him down, tries to reason with him, avoids conflict, she withdraws from him and from everyone else and agrees with what he says. She tries to satisfy with food. At this point, the abuse is mental, emotional, verbal, and very aggressive, and at times physical. At this stage, I don't have much hope for this relationship to survive. And if nothing happens, it will progress to the next stage. In this final stage, we call it acute explosion. Yeah, the physical abuse becomes a daily occurrence. He slaps, he punches, kicks, and chokes. Humiliates you in front of friends and family. Forces sex, in particular when he's drunk. Restrains you, even locking you up. Stalks you. Throws objects around the room and at you, spits at you, and abuses children. The victim, at this time, she protects herself in whichever way she can. She tries to calm him down, tries to cover up the abuse so no one else can see that what she's going through. She is desperate. She may call the police. She leaves or fights back. She only leaves if she's got enough guts to do it and fights back very often only when children are being abused. Right, in this next module, what we're going to do is we're going to have a look at women who are in an abusive relationship. Why don't they leave? And in fact, um, some research has shown that there are eight reasons why women stay in an abusive relationship. Um, this is research that was done by Professor Jason Whiting. And um, so let's run through these different reasons. The first one is distorted thoughts. Now, the, what we mean by distorted thoughts is that the woman actually starts believing what he, what the abuser is saying about her. When he starts telling her that she's no good and she's useless and no one else will ever want you, so you're lucky to have me. Um, those are the kind of things he starts saying and she actually starts believing that um, she's no good, she's worthless, she's a bad mother. Um, and for this reason, you know, 
she believes that he's right. And that's why she stays. The next one is damaged self-worth. The one thing that the abuser does, as we've seen up until this far, is that he breaks you down. And he makes her feel totally insecure. Her self-worth is totally destroyed. And she doesn't believe that she could actually make it on her own. And for that reason, she feels that she desperately will need him and she can't leave. She's got no other choice. Then the third one is fear. And where the fear really comes in is the fear of him and what the consequences will be. Because he has threatened very often to kill her family members, to kill or harm her friends. And so she doesn't want to leave because of what those consequences of violence may be. Or he might come after her, and then she's in real deep trouble. And for that reason, she rather just stays. Wanting also to be a savior. She realizes that he's got a problem, and she thinks that maybe she can help him. And the only way she's going to be able to help him is if she stays with him. Children, where children are involved, very often she believes, you know, for her children's sake, um, she can't leave because obviously there's the complication of finances. How is she going to look after her children? And so for that reason, she needs to stay in the relationship and she will rather keep getting the beatings but be able to make sure the kids can go to school and have got food and that kind of thing. Family expectations and experiences. So very often she feels that, what is my family going to say? And my family expect me to be a good mother. And my family expect me to do the right thing. And so for that reason, she thinks that if she walks away, people are going to blame her for the relationship being destroyed. Financial constraints, that's a pretty obvious one. Um, she just doesn't have the finances because he's in control of all the money. So she just doesn't have the money to be able to get her own place and be able to survive. And for that reason, she stays. And then the isolation. Very often uh, when it gets really bad, um, you know, she's just at home the whole time. If she's fortunate to be working, she'll just have to come straight home and go to work and come straight home. So she doesn't see anyone. She doesn't, isn't able to speak to anyone about what is going on. Um, and in particular, if she isn't working, she'll just be at home the whole time, isolated, not being able to speak to someone and say, please help me or explain to me what I can do or whatever. Um, and so that isolation very often is also the reason. Then a very important one is what we call codependency. And what codependency really means is that as much as she needs him, he actually needs her as well, because he needs her because he's got to have someone that he can control. And so let's just have a look at some points on codependency. So you are unhappy in the relationship, but fear the alternatives. And for that reason, you stay. Consistently neglect your own needs for the sake of theirs. You ditch your friends and sideline your family to please your partner. You frequently seek out your partner's approval. You want him to say, yes, you, that's like really good and whatever. You critique yourself through the abuser's eyes, ignoring your own instincts. So this is where you start believing him. You make a lot of sacrifices to please the other person, but it's not reciprocated. You would rather live in the current state of chaos than be alone. You bite your tongue and repress your feelings to keep the peace. 
You feel responsible and take blame for something they did. And you will defend them. You fear that your friends and community would blame you if you leave. You feel you would shame your family if you leave, so you stay. You defend the abuser when others point out what is happening. You try to rescue them from themselves. You feel guilty when you stand up for yourself. You think you deserve this treatment. You believe that nobody else could ever want to be with you. And this is just because you've become so insecure because of the constant breaking down. You change your behavior in response to guilt. Your abuser says, I can't live without you. So you stay. Right, how to get out of an abusive relationship. It is the most difficult thing. But here's just a little bit of advice that I want to give. And that is, if you are hoping your abusive partner will change, I'm sorry, it's not going to happen. I often get asked when I start talking about the misogynist, can they change? Can they go for counseling? Yes, they can go but I have never seen it work. And so for that reason, you know, if he keeps promising, I will change, I'll, I'll stop doing what I do. I'm afraid it doesn't happen. If you believe you can help your abuser, I'm afraid many have tried, but it doesn't work. If your partner has promised to stop the abuse, those of you who've been there, you will know how often has he promised. And it happens again. And in fact, I've seen sometimes, you know, especially out of uh, maybe when there's been a massive outburst of violence and a beating, um, and he is profusely sorry the next day. And he promises this will never happen again. This is the end. Sometimes it could even last six months, a year. And then it comes back, you know. So unfortunately, he the abuse will continue. If you're worried about what will happen if you leave, then you know that is always a big problem. Where you go, I don't know how I'll cope on my own. What if he follows me? What if this? What if that? If you're going to sit in that space, then you will never make a decision to leave. You've got to just say, you know what? I'll work it out. Someone will help me. I will make it through. I've got to get out. And the most difficult part of leaving is making the decision. It truly is, because once the decision is made and you go, things just get better. Things get easier. The most difficult thing is making that decision to leave. Right. So in closing, I would like to just reiterate that if you can pick up the problem in the relationship early, where the abuse is just starting, it is still possible to save that relationship through going for couples counseling. Obviously, you're going to have to get your partner to buy into it and to agree, yes, things aren't great and we really need to work on this. And then go for counseling and you can fix that relationship. However, unfortunately, when it gets to those later stages where it, it, the abuse has just increased and increased, and got to an extent where it's now physical, a lot of violence, that kind of thing. To try to fix that relationship, it's practically impossible. And my suggestion is the best thing you can do is get out of there as soon as you possibly can. 
it's not easy. It's a difficult decision to make. But once you've made it, that's when things get easier. And I think it, you will need help. You need someone to talk to. Sometimes a, a, just a friend or a family member to support you. But ultimately, the best thing to do is to speak to a counselor. And there is a lot of help around. So get in touch with a counselor and get them to assist you, allow you to believe that it is possible to get out and give you guidelines on how best to do that. The one thing that I often find is I get a phone call from a client that I worked with years before and then they say to me, Aubrey, I'm in a new relationship. This person is amazing. He loves me so much. Uh, I just wish I had got out of that other relationship earlier. And that's what I hear all the time. So don't wait. You will never regret the decision that you got out. I hope this session has been of benefit to you um, and that you take a lot out of this. To me, it's been an absolute privilege to spend this time with you. And I thank you. And uh, please all stay safe.